With roughly one and a quarter million songs in their library, ASCAP was the leading music royalty association in the United States and beyond in the 1930s. Working in tandem with Tin Pan Alley, it seemed their reign could never end. That was until 1941, when their most important ally decided to cut ties entirely. The radio industry. Hi everyone and welcome to Music Theories, where I explain and analyze all topics related to music. Be sure to subscribe for more content, especially if you're a music geek like me. First of all, thank you for 400 subscribers. I am so thrilled that our community continues to grow, and I'm looking forward to making it even larger. Thank you for all the support. In the previous video of this series, we talked about the establishment of the music publishing industry. As this industry continued to grow, the artists involved were looking to have more representation, more rights, and overall more control over the art that they were creating. The first step for artists' rights was the Copyright Act of 1909, which affirmed that musical artists needed to be paid for performances of their work, so long as their work was, one, published, and two, had legal notice of copyright affixed to it. Under this act, the copyrights of published works would be protected by the federal government, while the legality of unpublished works was dealt with on a state level. However, just because something is written into law doesn't mean that that law will be enforced. Enter ASCAP. ASCAP is an acronym that stands for the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. It was established in 1914 by a variety of composers, publishers, and an attorney, among others. Their first batch of members included Irving Berlin, James Weldon Johnson, Jerome Kern, John Philip Sousa, and more. ASCAP stated that their fundamental goal was to assure that music creators are fairly compensated for the public performance of their works and that their rights are properly protected. In other words, they were responsible for enforcing copyright law and therefore collecting royalties from those who were using the music within their library, whether that be through live performances or recorded performances. One of their landmark victories was in 1917 which stated that businesses were infringing on the artist's rights if they played copyrighted music in their establishment, even if they weren't charging patrons for admission to said establishment. This Supreme Court case would set up a precedent for music copyright, as well as a reputation for ASCAP and their willingness to fight for the rights of their artists. As music was typically performed live in theaters at this point, ASCAP would simply take a percentage of ticket sales from the theaters performing music associated with their library. As the radio became popular a few years later, it was a growing source of musical entertainment. At first, performers would play live and play for free. But as performers began to ask for pay, it proved to be cheaper for radio broadcasts to use a single recording multiple times. ASCAP was sure to step in and demand compensation for their members via what they called licensing fees, and radio proved to be a steady source of income for the society by the end of the 1920s. ASCAP also had a hand in the success of music from Hollywood films at the time. Soon enough, the most popular performers were represented by ASCAP, and their library had surpassed 1,250,000 songs. This was between 85 and 90 percent of the popular music circuit. In 1931, ASCAP reportedly made $960,000 in royalty fees from radio alone. The next year, they instituted blanket fees across the board based on a percentage of each station's income. The stations were required to report all songs played per quarter. They were provided a list of ASCAP members, however, they were not given a list of which songs were controlled by ASCAP. Between 1931 and 1939, the royalty rates ASCAP charged broadcasters was increased by over 400%. In 1940, they collected $7.3 million total, $4 million of which came from the radio. When it came time to renew contracts that same year, ASCAP attempted to double their royalty rates. There are a few possible reasons for this. One, they assumed they had the upper hand in the partnership and wanted to maximize profits. Two, they were growing increasingly nervous of the effect that radio performances would have on their phonograph record sales. And three, they knew that the National Association of Broadcasters was looking for alternative music sources. They were blindsided when, instead, radio broadcasters all over the country unified and decided to boycott ASCAP altogether. 
Now, clearly ASCAP was the music collection agency giant of the time. They didn't really have a competitor at this point, and they licensed most, if not all of the popular music in the US, which is probably why they believed they had the leverage to double their royalty rates. The National Association of Broadcasters decided to create their own licensing company as a lower cost alternative to ASCAP. They called it Broadcast Music Inc., or BMI, and they were not afraid to be petty. BMI sought out music they felt ASCAP was overlooking, such as regional music like rhythm and blues and country, as well as contracts with ASCAP that were about to expire. They also played music in the public domain and expanded to music of the classical repertoire. And to sweeten the deal for songwriters, they offered a fixed fee per performance system of payout, rather than ASCAP's two-tiered system, which favored more established writers. In the months leading up to the new year, the broadcasters were sure to warn everyone of the impending music emergency. As we can see in this issue of Broadcasting Magazine from December 15, 1940, there's also tons of print space dedicated to slandering ASCAP, as well as propagandizing the whole thing as a war, including steps that should be taken to avoid infringement. And they held on to it pretty intensely. There were to be no broadcasts that weren't approved in writing, or else they might be forced to pull a show's plug altogether. And so, beginning January 1st, 1941, all NBC and CBS stations refused to play music licensed by ASCAP. There were only four major radio networks beginning in 1934. National Broadcasting Company Red, National Broadcasting Company Blue, Columbia Broadcasting System, and Mutual Broadcasting System. Seeing that most of the radio industry was programmed by CBS and NBC, popular songs heard only the day before were nowhere to be found on the airwaves. And while both sides believed they were making a statement with these actions, what they didn't realize was that they were actually changing American music forever. I think a lot of the time people tend to minimize the effect that racism had and still has on American culture. Let me try to explain. Prior to the boycott, ASCAP and Tin Pan Alley were essentially responsible for what was popular. They pushed what they wanted to sell, created and rode the trends they wanted to capitalize on. It should be no secret that discrimination existed in these industries. ASCAP refused to allow many, many black artists to be members. Of their 170 members at the time, only six of them were black. Many record studios and venues refused to work with black artists altogether. The discrimination extended to Latinos and poor whites as well. ASCAP wouldn't do deals with hillbilly artists because they felt it was beneath them in some way. They would later go on to describe BMI songs as obscene junk and blame them directly for the popularity of Elvis Presley's animal posturings. Yikes. So if you can believe it, prior to the ASCAP boycott, many Americans had never heard music from black artists. They'd never heard jazz, or blues, or gospel. They'd never heard Latin music. They didn't even know it existed. If you know anything about the decades that followed 1941, it should come as no surprise that when the boycott finally ended in October of 1941, there was a high demand for certain types of music. The first was hillbilly music, which became known as western, or country and western. Race music, which was later classified as rhythm and blues and Latin-influenced music to accompany popular dances of the time like the mambo and the samba. The ASCAP boycott allowed for Americans to be exposed to music that was previously intentionally excluded from radio play. And as soon as it ended, ASCAP was pushing the greats of swing, like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Benny Goodman, and Fletcher Henderson. This public interest morphed into new genres like rock and roll, country, and various types of jazz but we'll get more into that as we go. BMI eventually turned into another giant corporation with similar ethics to ASCAP, and today it's actually the largest music performing rights organization in the United States. However, we can't deny the impact that this conflict had on the music to follow. This video is part of a series I'm making on the music industry and how it grew to be what it is today. Be sure to subscribe if you wanna see more of this content and also check out some of the other series I have up on my channel. Feel free to leave any additional information in the comments down below, as I love learning from you all as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.